most of us have never even fantasized about. Uh, her experiences bring together themes of outdoor adventure, environmentalism, education, sociology, and communication, all wrapped up in a challenging and interesting package. Today she's going to talk about a trip that she made by canoe from Minneapolis to Hudson Bay, which, you know, if you can calculate that, it turns out to be about 2,000 miles. Uh, the trip followed the path that had been um, initiated by, uh, in 1935, by um, Eric Severide, whose name is probably familiar to many of you. And Eric Severide wrote a book about his experience, and Natalie has written a book about hers. Um, the book is called Hudson Bay Bound, and it will be available from the University of Minnesota in uh, 2021. So I'm excited to read it, I'll keep an eye out for it. Uh, most recently, she has paddled the lake of the Mississippi, uh, and she won an award in 2016 from the Yukon, gotta get this right, Yukon River Quest for canoeing, get this, uh, 450 miles in 53 hours. Oh. I can hardly wrap my brain around it. Renette is not in a canoe. Uh, she lives in Minneapolis with her husband and dog, and together they're expecting their first child. And, you know, when she has a little spare time, she's working on her PhD in communication studies at the University of Minnesota. So, um, Natalie, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. I sound so much cooler on paper. <laughs> I, in 2011, was one of the first two women to recreate Eric Severide's route from the book Canoe to the Creek, paddling over 2,000 miles from Minneapolis, where uh, Fort Snelling State Park is, we left from Pike Island, to uh, Hudson Bay. Uh, I'm originally from Miami, Florida, and I did not grow up camping. <laughs> I went to an art school downtown for high school and I got really burnt out playing saxophone all day every day and needed to figure out what else I liked to do. And my friend told me about a YMCA camp called Camp Minogen up in Minnesota. I'd never been to the Midwest before. And as the youngest of three, I thought that this would be a sort of a way to ruffle my parents' feathers and suggest that I go to camp in Minnesota. So I started out on a two-week Boundary Waters trip. It was my first overnight camping experience when I was 15. My mom wrote me a letter saying, I hope you're enjoying the beautiful mountains of Minnesota. <laughs> so no one really knew where I was, including myself, actually. One night I was convinced that there were wolves around our tent because I kept hearing the howl of the wolf. But it was, in fact, the call of the loon, which my headmates told me when I woke up. So I had a lot to learn about place and space in Minnesota. I went on a progression of trips through Minogen, which culminated in a 50-day trip in Nunavut, Canada, paddling um, the Kazan and Inuit heritage uh, uh, Arctic rivers, so out in the tundra. And this is where I met my best friend, Anne. So Anne Rayho did grow up in Minnesota, and she did grow up camping and I thought she was so cool. And we ended up being paddling partners for this trip. And on our first day, we were just making small talk, saying, well, where are you going to college in the fall? And it ended up, we both were going to St. Olaf College, and we both end up in the same freshman dorm to plot for four years what we would do next. <laughs> so senior year rolls around, and it's 2011. The economy is still trying to recover from 2008, not a lot of people were getting jobs. And so we keep applying and keep not hearing back. We go, come back from winter break and Anne has a book in her hand and she comes into my dorm room and chucks it at me and says, we should just do this after school. And it was Eric Severide's Canoeing with the Cree. And I remember I was writing a paper at the time and instead of finishing my paper, I read the book from cover to cover. And I went to her the next day and I said, okay, we didn't have a canoe. <laughs> We didn't have any money, <laughs> uh, but we decided together that we would paddle three months instead of trying to continue to get jobs after college. Now, we uh, learned very quickly how to market ourselves. We ended up getting a lot of sponsors for gear and food, 
and raising money for our float plane at the end of the trip, which actually cost $2,000 for a 45-minute plane ride. Um, one response that really sticks out to me, we met a rep for a company and we told him what we were doing, he seemed excited, we sent him an email saying, you know, if you give us a spray skirt for our canoe, we'll be able to, you know, write about you in our blog and all these things. And we sent him a follow-up email and he responded to us saying, who cares that you're two women doing this trip? Women have had the right to vote since 1920, and, right? So you get where I'm going here. Very post-feminist. And as you know, we do not live in a post-feminist or post-racial world. Uh, we are still stuck within systems of patriarchy. And uh, I have an excerpt from my book, which is fun to say now, um, <laughs> how I felt about this response. At the age of 22, I was still trying to understand what it meant for us to be two women doing this trip. Was it physically harder for us as two women to do this trip? Of course not. Ann and I were setting out to paddle every day for 85 days, which is something that, believe it or not, most able-bodied people can do. But socially and politically, yes, absolutely, it was harder for us. The outdoor rep's response was proof in itself of the barriers women face while attempting to stake ground in the outdoors. At the, at the time, it was difficult for me to understand how Ann and I could break into a world that had historically been built for white men. The outdoor industry is still wildly homogenous in terms of gender and racial equality. This is a problem, but it is not an accident. According to a study done by REI during their first Force of Nature campaign, nearly 75% of women feel they are under more pressure to conform to social norms than men, and 72% say they feel liberated and free when they are outdoors. Women in the study noted that they feel pressure from society, mainstream media of men, and even other women to be sexy, lose weight, smile more, be less emotional and less dramatic. We are told we can feel free in the outdoors, yet more than half of the women surveyed could not think of a female role model in the outdoor industry. How can we rise up if we do not see ourselves in the roles that we aspire to? Women are especially underrepresented and oversexualized in outdoor advertising. Few women go on outdoor expeditions like ours, and consequently, there are few of us featured in outdoor articles. When you dig into it, the inequalities are stark. Outdoor adventures are often highly romanticized as carefree and relaxing summer vacations to escape the busyness of life or as strenuous physical endeavors that involve conquering mountains and slaying whitewater rapids. A dance with death that requires physical strength and yields a magnificent reward. But separate from the miserable weather and the dangers of the wild, it's easy to forget the compromises that people make when they venture out into canoe country. It's scary, and it's almost always easier to stay home. In my case, I was afraid that I would lose momentum to build my career after college. For others, that fear may involve leaving family or a job behind. It's a scary decision because we cannot predict how it will end and how it will change us. And it will change us. The most challenging part of an expedition is committing to do it, accepting the unknown changes that will inevitably occur in you and around you. That bravery alone is worth celebrating. So we often thought back to that email from the rep during our trip. And we actually met a lot of people on our expedition that were skeptical that we could make it all the way to the bay. But we use that as fuel to keep us going on Here's our route. So we started, like I said, Pike Island, Fort Snelling State Park. We went upstream on the Minnesota River during the 2011 flood. Oh. <laughs> Fun time. Uh, and then we took the Red River downstream, past Winnipeg into Canada. Uh, we paddled Lake Winnipeg, the 11th largest lake in the world surface area-wise. And then we took the Nelson River to the Etchemish Creek to the Hayes River, um, which is slightly different from Eric Severide's route at that point out to York Factory on Hudson Bay. So here is footage of us taken by Nick Coleman at our launch. Where we were supposed to leave from Pike Island was flooded out, so we found this inlet. And I was actually concerned that we wouldn't be able to paddle upstream. The DNR, Department of Natural Resources, contacted us and told them that we should delay our trip until the water level went down but we decided to try it out and see how it went. So, as you can see here, we're moving along for 330 miles. Can anyone guess how many miles per hour we could paddle? 
1.5. It is the slowest form of transportation. We could have walked the Minnesota River faster than we have. But that was not the point. We heard before we left on this trip that the Minnesota River is the river of chocolate milk. It's a polluted agricultural river. And some people told us that it's too bad we have to do this part of the trip. So we had really low expectations. But you may know that when you start out paddling this section of the river going upstream, you start out in a national wildlife refuge. So our first day, we actually had some otters come and play by our boat. This is in no way to suggest that the Minnesota River is a healthy river ecosystem. Um, it is a polluted agricultural place, and it is slowly dying. Um, you can tell when you are paddling it. You can see, as Rachel Carson says in Silent Spring, the scars that we have left on the landscape. You can see the river speaking to us in the eroded banks. You can see the trees that no longer can keep their roots in the soil and fall into the river with the frequent flooding and continue to float downstream. You can see old infrastructure, um, like this power plant that no longer operates, in which there are no plans or no funding to figure out what to do with after we've built all of these things. Agriculture. Um, we were paddling through America's Corn Belt for a big chunk of this trip. And I studied environmental policy and I learned all about buffer zones. And when you're learning about things in a textbook, you feel like we've really got it figured out. And then you get out into the world and we saw um, a lack of buffer zones. We saw the water, granted it was a flood, going straight over cornfields. When we were on the Red River, we would cut corners paddling over corn. And what this essentially means is that the chemicals and the fertilizers we are using on these fields are not just running off in a rain event, they are going directly into our river system, which flows into the Mississippi River, which impacts communities downstream and industries all the way down in the Gulf in the dead zone. Um, tiling practices is a common thing. So now we're trying to drain as much water as possible off of our land into the river. And so the river is holding more water than ever, which is a huge cause of the eroded banks that we saw. This picture was taken by a journalist in Granite Falls when we were paddling up to the Granite Falls Dam. When you're paddling upstream, you're moving slowly. When you're paddling upstream to a dam, you're moving very slow, if at all. The current is much stronger at that point. And so Anne and I found that as we were paddling up to the dam, I looked over at a tree and I saw that tree trunk was not moving and we were essentially on a river trip now. And at this particular moment, I had communicated to Anne that we should just pull over. There was a path by the river. We would carry our things over the dam and put in again. Just as we had agreed to do this, the journalist popped out of the bushes and started taking pictures of us and saying, you can do it, you can paddle all the way to the dam. We had a lot to prove. So we paddled all the way to the dam. Um, and as we did, people from Granite Falls just kept coming to the shore and cheering us on. And we finally get there, you know, a ridiculous, just like, you could see the dam and it took us 45 minutes at least to get there. And the mayor was there and we got out and we're hopping and hopping and he's like, wow, I've never even seen two guys do that before. <laughs> Why would anyone do that? So after we paddled the Minnesota River, we finally got to go downstream on the Red River of the North. It was still very flooded. Can anyone guess how many miles a day we were paddling? So we were going 12 to 15 miles a day on the Minnesota River. Now we're with the current. 35, 25? We're going 50 to 60 miles a day. We were just so excited to be going fast that we paddled all day long. <laughs> On our trip, we came across this monument. It's five empty tractor seats to represent the disappearance of the family farm. We were going through a lot of these agricultural small towns. Uh, you used to need an entire community to farm. You used to need at least an entire family to farm. And now what's happening is that larger corporations are buying out plots of land, and some people don't even live on that farmland anymore. They rent it out. And so we would go into small towns with dilapidated buildings, 
foreclosure signs. People would show us around, and the story was the same. It was, this place used to be really cool, but now uh, the changes in agriculture are changing the changes in our small towns in America. That was not the case, however, in Climax, Minnesota, where this wonderful group of people with the International Water Institute are very active on the Red River. They work with kids, they do kayaking trips. When we got there, they threw a barbecue for us. And everyone at this barbecue was telling us the same story. There's a neighboring town of Fertile, and there was a woman from that community. I'm so sorry that I'm about to tell this joke for you guys. <laughs> There's literally a Star Trek that's like, please stop telling this joke. Um, so this woman from Fertile was murdered in their community, and the next day the newspaper title was Fertile Woman Dies in Climax. <laughs> so we had to cross the border into Canada. This is not easy to do on a canoe. Anne, who is much better at logistics than I am, she had contacted the border station previously, sent over our passports, told them what we were doing, and they agreed to meet us directly on the river so that we wouldn't have to portage or carry all of our things over a mile to the border station. We didn't really know what to expect though. So we're paddling the river, we know we're getting close to Canada, and we turn the corner and there are two huge black SUVs on top of a bridge. And when they see us, they turn their sirens on. <laughs> and they drive down to the bank of the river. The Red River, especially during a flood, is very, very muddy. We were caked in mud for weeks. And so you can't actually paddle and get off onto dry land. You paddle until your canoe gets stuck into mud. And then you get out and you try not to sink into the mud yourself while you drag it along. And so six border agents come out and they are sparkling clean <laughs> in all of their uniform. And they are watching us do our daily struggle of just trying to get to the shore. And eventually we leave our canoe about 30 feet away and we slop in the mud over to them. And they look at us and they look at the canoe and they're like, we're not going to go over there. So why don't you just bring your gun and we'll take you to the border station. We brought a shotgun with us for extra protection in polar bear country. Um, this was mostly to make our parents feel just a little bit better. <laughs> what happened was they took Anne to the border station to sign the waiver. And it took her about an hour because it was a really hot July day. And when Anne's nervous, she gets heated up and she turns red. And she was still wearing her light jacket and she was sweating and they accused her of acting suspiciously and so had to keep her for extra questioning. Meanwhile, I pride myself in having fairly good social skills, but I was stuck on the riverbank with these three border agents trying to make conversation, wondering where the heck Anne was, and eventually I just gave up and we all just stood there in silence. But we left and we turned the corner into Canada. Canada for us meant poutine. We had been, we're burning thousands of calories a day, and all we want is french fries covered in gravy and cheese curds. <laughs> so we pull into the first small town that we find, and we walk up to a little bar, and we peek our heads in, and we just go, do you have poutine? And the bartender stops, and he looks at us and says, we have the best poutine in Manitoba. <laughs> So we stopped, we played some pool, we ate poutine, and then classic Anne and Natalie on an adventure decided that we could paddle 100 miles straight overnight into Winnipeg. We had just cargo loaded, we were full of adrenaline, ready to go. And our big inspiration for this was that Anne's parents were meeting us in Winnipeg and we knew we would be able to stay in a hotel and have a little, like, how full day of rest ahead of us. So we took off. At this point, there were no more dams in the way, um, so we thought. And the moon was out, and so we could see where we were going on the river. This is about 10.30 PM in July. It's around 11.30 PM, so the sun is out. This is around 1 AM, the moon. We kept singing Cat Stevens' Moon Shadow, but we only knew one verse, so we would just repeat it over and over and over again until you just get sick of it and move on. The sun started to show light in the sky around 4, 4.30 a.m. 
and this is around 5, 530. At this point, we can calculate we're moving five miles an hour, we'll be in Winnipeg by 7 a.m., Anne's parents will pick us up on the river and we'll go to the hotel and we'll sleep. 7 a.m. rolls around, and there's this big sign pointing at the river that just says danger. <laughs> Nothing else, and it's clearly meant for people who are using this river. So I'm a little more laissez-faire. I'm like, that's an interesting sign. You know, let's keep going. And Anne's like, what is that sign? So we had to pull over, and she started calling authority figures in Winnipeg to ask what it was. Nobody knew what she was talking about, and so we just had to continue after not sleeping for over 24 hours at this point. We turn the corner and there's a massive dam with a control tower on top and rushing white water at the bottom. Uh, they had opened the floodgates around Winnipeg uh, during this flood. And so uh, at this point, Anne and I were like, well, we'll have to portage over this. And it might take a while. We go to one side, there's no portage path. It's just massive boulders stacked on top of each other up to a road. And so I thought, well, there must have been paddlers at the planning meeting for this infrastructure building. There maybe is a path on the other side. So what we had to do at that point was start to use some of our whitewater skills that we'd be using later. And we forward ferried. So we, if we were to just cross, I learned all my physics from paddling. Um, if we were to just cross the river, we would have been pushed into the dam. But what we did is we pointed our canoe at a 45 degree angle upstream and then slowly crossed the river to the other side where there was not a path either. <laughs> so we spent three hours portaging our gear over the top and on our last time carrying our gear, this guy comes out of the control tower and he's holding a cup of coffee and he's having a leisurely day and when you're angry and tired, that's the last person you want to see. And so it's like, where are you ladies going? We're like, we're going to Hudson Bay. Oh, okay. We start walking away and then Anne just turns around and goes, did you put that sign out there? It's like, yeah, we're letting people know the floodgates are open. And she just snaps and starts yelling at him about how he needs to put a number on it. Meanwhile, I'm dragging Anne down and saying, thank you for letting us portage your dam. So we make it to Winnipeg. This is where the Assiniboine River flows into the Red River at the wharf. And it was flooded. Um, if you've ever been to this wharf area, it's a big touristy spot but a lot of it was closed down because of the heavy flooding in 2011. We did get to sleep. I convinced Anne we needed to see the premiere of Harry Potter at midnight before we showered, and it was, we were the smelliest people in the theater, but we watched it. From here, we knew that big challenges were ahead. <laughs> That's Anne. Lake Winnipeg. If you've read Canoe with the Cree, you know that Lake Winnipeg is a shallow, very large lake, and when the winds kick up, it will kick up massive waves that make it extremely unsafe to paddle. We had heard a lot of horror stories about Lake Winnipeg, but this is what it looked like when we got there. It was completely flat for the first two or three days. You're like, what is everyone talking about? Well, we were two days into an 18-day trip up the shore. We were finally entering the wilderness. We could watch the sun set into itself, into the horizon every night. We started to see more wildlife. One night we tried to do a night paddle, but the moon didn't show and something was weird in the air. And so we decided to pull over. And after we did, a huge lightning storm came through. Orange sky, it actually started a fire just northeast of us. And finally, as we're falling asleep to the crashing waves, I look up and there are bear paws pushing at the top of our tent. Oh. And so I jump to the other side of the tent and I go, Anne, get the foghorn! Because Anne's mother needed us to be very prepared. So she gave us a small foghorn for the sole purpose of scaring bears away. And we never thought we would use it. And here we are in the middle of the night rummaging through our things trying to find a tiny foghorn. Well, Anne whips it out and pushes it, and it just goes <laughs> Not a huge deal. You can scare, it was a black bear, get out, scare it away, look really big. Um, and it ran back into the woods. But um, the next morning, we were making breakfast. The wind was still, still too strong to paddle. 
I take the fog horn and I say, I can't believe this didn't work last night. And I push it right next to Anne's face and the horse oh. goes, <laughs> The waves started to get a little bit choppier for us. And some days we would paddle into storms for hours, knowing we could get a little bit further before the storm finally hit us. I didn't take this picture. If you've ever tried to take a picture of the Northern Lights with a mediocre camera, it doesn't work. Uh, but we were doing a night paddle one night. We launched, the lake was completely flat, the stars were out, the Milky Way was out, and it was reflecting on the lake. So it looked like you were paddling through space. Now, Anne and I got along really well for two people spending 100 days together operating as one, which is a difficult thing to do. But at this point in our trip, we had a rift. Um, I was not concerned enough about our safety in Anne's eyes, and Anne was too anxious about all of our decisions in my eyes. And this had really, really grown over the last month. And finally, what made us tip was I was sterning, I was controlling the canoe, and Anne didn't like how far out I was pointed from the shore. And she asked me to turn closer, and I thought I did, but I didn't. Uh, and then she just started yelling at me. So we're in the middle of this lake, all alone, completely quiet, and we are just screaming at each other. <laughs> Meanwhile, unbeknownst to us, the northern lights start to come out. So this small green glow starts to dance above us. We reach a point where we cannot come to a conclusion and we are not talking to each other. But now we're just paddling in silence, watching the northern lights expand and grow in front of us. The only thing that we said to each other that night was I was getting a little bit too close to shore, overcompensating. Um, and I was like, hey, can you take out your headlamp and see where the shore is? And she takes it out, she shines it towards the trees, and there are two huge green eyes from a bull moose about 100 Aww. feet away. And she just says, yep, we're too close to shore. <laughs> I wrote Anne a letter. I'm much better with writing than I am with speaking, especially in arguments about how we are in fact sisters, not friends, and to start to reconceptualize our relationship as one that includes conflict as friendships should as well, and overcoming those obstacles. From then on, we got along much better every day, which was great because we were about to be windbound for seven days, which is stuck on a beach. If you've ever wanted to be dropped on a desert island, Highly recommend Lake Winnipeg. Um, on our first day being windbound, we were making food and a snake slithers by, and I overreacted, and did not. Um, and then another snake comes by, and then another snake comes by. And we look in all these twigs that are pushed up on shores, and there are snakes just wrapped all in them. It was a snake nest that we were camped on. And so we quickly, without talking, packed everything up, looked at the lake and realized we couldn't go anywhere. And so we waited several hours until we just paddled quickly around the, show, around the corner and set up camp for the next three days there. We finally finished Lake Winnipeg, and when we saw the, Nels the mouth of the Nelson River, both of us just started bawling because we knew we had just accomplished one of the biggest feats of our trip, even though we still had so much ahead. We got to a community called Norway House, where they were celebrating York Boat Days, where they, uh, the Cree people who live there, they race these huge York boats. And these were what the Hudson Bay Company used to do um, trading and things like that through a lot of the routes that we were on. We were very lucky to stay with a uh, Cree council member, Mike Mushwagen, and his family for a couple days to learn more about the community that is there. And as you can imagine, it is a similar but different story based on the place and their history and history of displacement. Manitoba Hydro flooded their lands. Um, and so now what is used for hydro on the Nelson River used to be the lands where these people would hunt and live and live dramatically. And then they were forced into this smaller community where 85% of people are on welfare. Unemployment is very high. Um, and they're facing a lot of these issues still today, which often happens when you separate people from their land. 
we were talking to Mike one night, and he was telling us about all of these struggles they were having, and he landed on the subject of stray dogs. It's like, you know, we have a lot of stray dogs. We don't have a, a humane society. And so in the winter, they sometimes pack up and attack people. You should take a dog. <laughs> you know, Anne's 21, I'm 22, we don't live anywhere. <laughs> but Mike looked at us and he said, ladies, you need to take a dog because you're going into polar bear country. And if a polar bear comes, it'll eat your dog and it'll time to load your gun. <laughs> right away and did not use her as life bait, for those of you who are concerned. Um, but we were very afraid of going into polar bear country. Polar, you hear stories of polar bears stalking people, they can smell you from 20 miles away, right? We were concerned about these things and we thought maybe having a dog would help. So we drove around one night <laughs> and we were looking for a dog about this big to fit in the canoe and finally I saw the silhouette of a dog Around that size, she was licking ketchup packets off a parking lot outside of their movie theater. And I just ran and picked her up and I put her in the car and the next day we put her in the canoe. She was afraid of water. <laughs> which worked out really well because she would stay in the boat all day instead of trying to jump out. We named her Maihan, Mahihan in Cree means wolf. And we like to think that she was part of at this point in our trip, Anne and I had already talked about everything there was possibly to talk about, and now we were injected with this really adorable fluffy thing, and so everything became, oh my gosh, look at my hon. Oh my god. It was a wonderful addition to our expedition. So we finally got to the Hayes River, the wilderness river that we were trying to get to for so long. White water sets, we see moose and bears and wildlife really, really coming out of the woodworks. It's really fun to paddle white water with someone that you work well with. Um, but it took us a couple sets to get back into the norm. It's also challenging when what you're paddling is essentially your home. So you cannot take as many risks as you would with other lives. So I have a video that I'd like to show you of the last couple days of our trip. As you see, we start to enter the taiga. The trees get smaller and smaller before you get to the tundra. This was the creek we had to take to get to the haze, Etchemosh and Cream, and this river that flows both ways. There were a lot of beaver dams, and so this was a common occurrence for us to have to lift our canoe. Over. Once I stepped out and I decided not to put my boots on, I kept my chakras on to lift the canoe over, and when I brought my feet back into the canoe, I had 55 leeches. Oh. But now I'm not afraid of leeches. <laughs> Um, 
Right, so I'd like to share with you uh, the journal entry that I last wrote on this trip. We ran several rapids until we reached White Mud Falls, our last set, portage, anything. I felt very emotional because I knew that after this portage, there was nothing that could stop us from making it to York Factory. The last few days brought emotional and physical challenges that left us exhausted and sore. After almost three months on trail, we were finally ready to end our trip. I felt a lack of nutrition had worn on my health, and I couldn't wait until I could eat fruits and vegetables again. While the hope of York Factory and relaxation was still at our fingertips, we still had 200 kilometers to go on the river, and the rumors of Holy polar bear country echoing in our minds. This is at the very last set. We paddled hard. Endurance and longevity are our strengths, and we plan to make the four-day trip from White Mud to York Factory in a mere two days. Our day lasted 15 hours before the sun made us retire to the shore. The moon did not show as we built our first fire to fight the cold. We planned to stay up all night, but after an hour, we felt the weight of our exhaustion and gave in to the comfort of our tent and sleeping bags. Ironically, for Anne, it was one of the best nights of sleep, despite our anxiety in polar bear country. I slept, but I dreamt of creatures surrounding the tent and felt a deep sorrow that we would never actually make it to the end. We left camp that morning without breakfast and continued on flowing haze. We heard stories of a thick fog and dark clouds typical to this section of the river, but we had a clear morning. We approached the turn where the God's River joins the haze, and we saw our first woodland caribou swimming across the water. The current quickened at the conjunction, and we had a floating breakfast of cold quinoa and chili powder from the night before. We continued on our way. With 10 more hours of paddling ahead, we felt as far away from New York factory as we ever had. Our wrists ached, hands clenched, and minds more than anything were on the verge of insanity. The river was beautiful, though. There were high white mud cliffs on the right and low-lying spruces on the left, decorating the shoreline, always reminding us of our desolation. Our strokes slowed and stomachs turned, and we became desperate for the hours to pass. All of a sudden, from behind us, we heard a huge clap of thunder that spooked us both. Just then, a pack of wolves, five total, one black, came out to the riverbank from behind the spruce. The air was still. There was a suspicious calm. The wolves stopped in their tracks when they felt our presence. We stared. They stared. My hand barked. A bird broke the silence with a loud cry, and the sound brought goosebumps to our skin. We glanced at the dark cloud floating behind us, and we were off with the motiva motivation reminiscent of our efforts on the Red River. We reached the rock, a big rock on the riverbank that signified our remaining distance of 50 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 30 kilometers, two more hours. We sang every song we knew, including some Christmas medleys. <laughs> We saw seals, caribou, a black bear. Every white rock looked as if it were swimming our way, and I joked that someone should spray paint them all black to soothe the nerves of canoeists on the haze. We were 10 kilometers away. We were hungry, tired, and desperate. It felt as though something could still go wrong. A storm or a bear? Could we really just arrive unscathed at York Factory? We passed the point where the tide effect could slow us down but we were still moving steadily toward the bay. We turned left, and there it was, Hudson Bay. <laughs> Overwhelmed with hunger, we did not joyously celebrate the sight of the bay, but solemnly paddled toward it. I didn't know what to say, and I didn't quite know how to feel. These last few days have been some of the most trying days of my life, and I knew I could relax now, but I felt an emptiness as well. This has been my lifestyle for 85 days. And there was no party or trophy at the end, just a set of stairs leading up to a building that once manufactured York boats. How was 
this a major destination for tourists? Who made the bay into a rite of passage? The history is interesting, and we were in awe at the expanse of water, but what made our voyage so significant and important to others? I do not yet understand the magnitude of our adventure and the importance of being the first two women to complete it. I'm sure I will reflect on these questions for years to come. So this is York Factory. It used to be a community of over 300 people. And if your family actually came to the Midwest around the 1850s, uh, it's very likely that they came through a very similar route that we had taken through York Factory. The bank here, you can see, is quite eroded. It erodes eight meters a year because of the melting permafrost. They've had to move that big white building three times because if it were in its original location, it would currently be underwater. When Eric Severide and Walter Port got to York Factory, they actually went to church. Um, the community was still vibrant at this point, at that point, but now only three caretakers live there throughout the summer. When we got up the stairs, we found the caretakers, and they said, it's a good thing you're here because we're all leaving tomorrow and the season is ending early. Oh. And we had just paddled, you know, 100 kilometers a day to get to where we were going. And it would have been fine if they weren't there. We would have set up camp, but it would have been more dangerous because a lot of the polar bear population is on um, the shores of Hudson Bay. So luckily, we were actually able to stay in this little cabin instead of camping, which was great because as we pulled over and we were talking to them, a polar bear came around the corner. Very cool to see a polar bear in the wild, and especially nice to see it when you're not just camping, where you have somewhere to go inside. Uh, so we watched this polar bear meander throughout the landscape during the day, and we went to sleep that night, and I remember being so excited that we got to sleep in beds and that maybe we could sleep in a little bit, but Anne wakes me up so early, and she's like, you've got to see this. I'm like, oh, God. So we get up, and we push this really heavy metal door, and as the sun is rising, you can see the polar bear running on the boardwalk, the caretaker's German Shepherd chasing the polar bear, and the caretaker on an ATV with flares chasing that, and they're all moving at about the same speed, and it's sort of looked like a scene from a Wes Anderson film, which is <laughs> unreal, and I looked at Anne and I said, I think it's time we go home. <laughs> There's the old church. Before we left, we branded our paddles with the old York factory sign. The M is for Minogen from our long trips. And then we took a $2,000 45-minute plane ride uh, to Gillum, Manitoba, where we then took a 35-hour train ride to Winnipeg, where we got out, we got there during rush hour, the city was bustling, and our friends came with a van to pick us and our gear and our dog up. And we're loading the van, and I'm like, oh, Anne, I think our shotgun is still loaded. We should empty that before we go across the border. She's like, oh, yeah, OK. And so you see all these people with briefcases and business suits walking around, and then you see Anne just pumping a shotgun outside of the train station. And I remember thinking, is this normal? I don't even know. We drove across the border. We were very nervous to cross the border because we had picked up a dog. Um, and so we finally, it was our turn in line. Our friend Megan hands over our passports. And the border agent says, well, what have you been doing? And Megan says, well, these ladies just paddled the Hudson Bay. And the woman says, no shit, go on ahead. <laughs> have a cabin at the end of the Gunflint Trail where we went and we just sat for two weeks looking out at the lake trying to process what had just happened to us. Um, I've learned a lot in it's almost been a decade since this trip trying to understand what it all meant and I think one of the biggest takeaways that I had before this trip I was worried that it would be a hole in my resume that I was somehow doing something wrong that I wasn't supposed to be doing 
to get all of the things that we're supposed to get out of life. Uh, if you've read Sarah Ahmed, scholar, writer, feminist at all, she writes about happy objects and how our lives are oriented towards certain objects, um, which can be different for different people, but thinking about education and marriage and house and kids and this whole trajectory that we feel like we are on. And you probably know better than I do at this point that life is not linear. And that thinking that life is linear or orienting ourselves to certain things that we think we should have actually leaves out all of these experiences and opportunities that we could be taking that feel scary because they're different, but doesn't mean that we can't also find a certain type of happiness there. I'd like to end with a poem. It's by Robert Blythe. It's called The Man Who Wanted to Live His Life Over, but I've renamed it to be The Woman Who Wanted to Live Her Life Over by Roberta Blythe. Um, <laughs> What? You want to live your life over again? Well, I suppose, yes. That time in Grand Rapids. My life, as I lived it, was a series of shynesses. Being bolder, what good would that do? I'd open my door again. I felt abashed, you see. Now I'd go out and say, all right, I'll go with you to Alaska. Just opening the door from inside would have altered me a little. I'm too shy. And so a bolder life is what you want. We could begin now. Just walk with me down to the river. I'll pretend this boat is my life. I'll climb in. Thank you. where you are today, what you're doing now. Yeah, so I am in the second year of the PhD program at the University of Minnesota in Communication Studies, and my current research is on the movement to give rights to nature, and I can focus specifically on rivers. Uh, but basically everything that happened after this trip was I was doing environmental policy on rivers, I was leading canoe trips, I was doing environmental education about rivers, and that seems to be sort of the central artery of everything that I do there. I am so tired. Listening. <laughs> I can't even imagine, but how long did it take you to recover physically from all of that, or were you just not too long? You were very young. If I would do it, I'd be dead. But. <laughs> Expeditions, I found, and, you know, it does have to do with me being a younger, able bodied human being. Uh, the, Training is built into the trip itself, so it, like upstream builds your muscles for when you're on the lake and when you're doing white water. And then at that point, you're you're so used to it. I remember every night I would feel my biceps and just get bigger and bigger and feel so good about it. Uh, so physically, we were just used to it, and so I think what we had to recover from was our bodies were no longer moving every day, and that was the hard part. Just one thing, because I'm getting old and don't like to cook anymore, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What the heck did you eat every day? <laughs> did you bring that all with you? Yeah, it's tricky. We learned a lot at Minogen how to pack out for expeditions like this, and we didn't take any dehydrated meals that you just add water to, so we were cooking every night. Uh, in the morning, oatmeal, biscuits, just a lot of carbs. Um, 
we had salami logs and cheese. So we had three different food drops throughout the trip. So we had a month of food at a time. Although at Norway House, before we left, one of the dogs ate all of our fresh food. So we were using Bisquick in every variety that you can think of to use Bisquick. Um, but yeah, pastas, rice, things like that. Water, what was your water source? Water, when we got to the Etchemamsh and the Hayes, you could dip your cup right into the river and drink from it, which is a privilege that we do not have anymore in a lot of places and probably will not have in those areas in the future. Uh, we carried three to four days of water with us at a time on the Minnesota River, the Red River, and started to filter a little bit on Lake Winnipeg. We had jugs of water that we'd have to sometimes hitchhike into towns to get refills. Yes, we fished when we got up to the haze, and we, uh, yeah, we would eat, I think it was like Arctic char, and I'm forgetting what else, but we'd catch and flay. It's really easy to fish up there. You just throw a line in, and something that catches. This question over here. Uh, Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. This was fascinating. Thank you. Um, how long, uh, how long did it take you to, um, Travel the lake, lake, um, lake Winnipeg. It took us 18 days, and wow. the story of Lake Winnipeg is much larger than I can even get into here. We ended up briefly working at a resort to be able to stay in. It, it just, yes, so read the book. Um, but it took a long time. <laughs> Yeah, nature is its own deadline for a trip like this because things freeze over pretty quickly and it was already in the 30s when we were nearing the end of our trip. So we knew that we had only so much time and we left two days after we graduated college. So we had graduation and then we had the freeze and we knew we had to do it within three months. Now that this trip is over, what do you have plans? Uh -huh. A baby. <laughs> and making them like canoeing without being too overbearing. Um, yeah, I mean, I always, I always get this question. and um, we, So I've done the Mississippi and I've done the Yukon, and so much of my life now is learning more about the experiences that I've had and trying to pair what I've done with my academic research, uh, which often involves staying in one place physically for the time being. But um, yeah, Ann and I still go on trips. We're paddling part of the Colorado River in March, and I get out on the Mississippi River a couple times a week in the summer. So it's become a little bit more embedded into my life rather than taking three months off of life, which as you know, can be very challenging as the older you get, the more responsibilities that you have. Thank you.